And um, uh, we ought to praise him for that. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to begin reading in the first verse. Jeremiah chapter 2, beginning in the first verse. The Bible says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord. What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of a shadow and the shadow of death, the, uh, through a land that no man passed through that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine inheritance an abomination. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they handled the law and, and they that handled the law knew me not. And the pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after the things that do not profit. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for an opportunity to preach your word this morning. We pray, Lord, for those that hear, Lord, that, uh, that you would give them listening ears and an open heart, Lord. We pray uh, for the lost that need it with us service by service, Lord, that you would grant them salvation this morning. Lord, we pray that we would honor your word in our you would honor your word in our preaching, Lord. And we pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, maybe some not so familiar verses. Uh, the only uh, uh, by, uh, the only book I see more neglected than Jeremiah is Ezekiel. And I think both of those books are, are ignored because both of them serve as a warning. Now, if ever we lived in a day and age today where people do not like warnings, it's today. But one warning, that, and I'm not afraid to give warnings, uh, judgment is coming. Judgment is on its way. The end is very nigh, and I'd be a very poor preacher if I didn't give you some warnings, right. if I didn't tell you uh, what is very, very close at hand. Uh, I told you this morning, look at Israel. Listen, uh, when, they, when Israel's under the gun, watch, pay attention. Uh, you know, all these people, and, and the Bible's very clear, no man can know the day nor the hour, but we can look to the trees. Right. We can see the seasons by the trees. Right now, it's the fall of the year. The trees are beautiful. Uh, all over our yard, we have leaves everywhere, you know, because it's time for that to happen. Right. It's the fall of the year. Yeah. And, and, and so we see then the very same principles can be applied to the Word of God. And many times, people don't do this because this is predicting the judgment of Israel. Now, the good thing about Jeremiah the prophet, and I think he's used a little more than the others, is that he was a very compassionate man. He's referred to as the weeping prophet. Uh, the Lamentations of Jeremiah. Even after what he said, listen, they're coming. They're going to take you away. They're going to put you in bondage. 
and it happened, he didn't sit back and laugh. He, he, he wasn't rejoicing. Well, I told him it was going to happen. No, no. He weeped over their situation. He weeped over his situation. You know what? That's a very compassionate man. Uh, Donna's brother, Christopher, is very frequently the same way. He weeps when, his, when he preaches, and sometimes I wish I had that level of compassion. Uh, but what I've seen with men, the older they get, the less compassion they have, and I can say that now because I'm past middle age, and, and, and I don't have the compassion that I once did. It's not that I don't like people, but I don't know that I'm compassionate as I once was. So we see two things about Jeremiah in the beginning. Number one, he was a truthful prophet. And number two, he was a loving prophet. And he carried that throughout his ministry. In the first verse, the Bible says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And uh, whatever Jeremiah got from God, he gave out. You know, the biggest problem we have today, I don't believe that it's people are not hearing from God. Men's men are, uh, that men's preaching, God's preaching men are not hearing from God. They're failing to preach it. Yeah. And that ought not to be. If we're hearing from God, if it's good or bad or pretty or ugly, it's our responsibility to preach the word. And if they like it, good. And if they don't like it, oh, well, that's good too, right? Preach the word. And you know what? It will offend some. So the message that Jeremiah is about to get and that he's to preach from is not a good message. He follows Israel through, uh, through many, many things and says, despite all these things that happen, you are still not serving God. Right. You know what a hallmark of a redeemed and saved person is? They'll serve God. And you know what a hallmark of a person who's lost? They will never serve Him. And you know what goes deeper than that? You know what a hallmark of a fake is? They'll go about this far and they'll drop and, and, and that is that that is the type of people. So you know what? Uh, we need to rejoice when sincere salvation happens to somebody, because you know what? That's that's another person you'll always be able to depend on. That that you'll always say, "Yeah, they'll be here. They'll do their part." And. Jeremiah was faithful to what he was given, even though it wasn't the best kind of news. Verse 2, the Bible says, Go cry in the ears of Jerusalem. Now, if you remember, uh, very same uh, similar words came to Jonah. He says, Go to that great city Nineveh and cry out against it, for their sins have come before me. Go. What, what was the Lord as he was ascending? What, what was his message? Very last message. Go. 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 And he, give a, he, 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 he said a big thing out there. Go into all the world. That's right. And, and that, that, that's more than Nineveh and it's more than Jerusalem. And, and we should take that very seriously. So I want you to see as always our God deals in specifics. And he says, Jeremiah, go to Jerusalem. Now, with, with that destination uh, specifically in hand, uh, you know, Judah was supposed to be the good kingdom. Judah was supposed to be the faithful people. And that's where Jerusalem was. But we're going to find out they're not that faithful. Jerusalem was the city that God created where his people were to dwell and they weren't faithful. You ever been in a seemingly sound church and people weren't faithful? Now, I, I've preached in some strange places down through my years, and I was invited to preach in a church in West Tennessee several years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago now. And I went down there and I agreed to preach in a little, little independent Baptist church and I'm not making this up. All through the hour I was preaching, 
people would just come in and sit down. And by the time we were done, the building was about half full, and we started with about six. Uh, you know what that is? That's people who are not faithful. That are, that's individuals, apparently they don't love God the way I do. And they don't love the church the way I do. And, and, and why, and like I said, I, I, was very, I came home and told Donna, that's the blue, that's the strangest thing I've ever seen. But uh, what it shows is the, uh, the level of respect the church had for the Lord and the level of respect they had for the church. And, and, and so we see that whatever the very best of the best is Jerusalem and, 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 the, Ju and the kingdom of Judah should be, they had problems. Go cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee the kindness of thy youth. Now, uh, saved people, listen to me. You think about when the Lord first saved you, how sweet and how precious and how good and how much instantly you loved the things of the Lord when he first saved you. Now, if you don't have something to compare to that, dear friend, make your calling and election sure because that should be the immediate response to salvation is a dear, dear, compassionate love for your Savior. And he says, you remember that? When they were a brand new nation? Anybody know how many people they started with? The Bible does document it. 70. Yeah. And that's a little nation, is it not? It's like Sharon, Tennessee. Just a little, little bitty speck on the map. But he said, back when you were then, you served me better than you do now. How many people were there when they left Egypt? 4.5 million. You see, that's what God can do. And he says, you love me better then than you love me now. You love me better when there was almost none of you now that there's an innumerable multitude. You love me better then. But the cry of the but cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals. Now, uh, I think that's uh, kind of an unusual place to put that, but it's not saying they were married to anyone. What's an espousal? Uh, this was the situation Mary and Joseph were in. They were a spouse. Don and I were engaged for nine months before we married. That was my espousal. And then when you marry, it becomes a spouse, right? And, and, and he says, so who did they have an agreement with? Who did they have a promise engagement with? The Almighty, right? And they had more than one promise. You ever seen vows in uh, marriage? There's more than one promise there, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I promise to take God and care of God the rest of her life. I promise to love her only the rest of my life. A number of espousals. And he said, when you were young, you kept those promises. What about now? Jared and Hannah's fixing to get married. You gonna mean the you gonna mean the promises you said, right? And, and so he is complimenting Israel when they're young, and says, "You promised me, and you did better then. When you when you went just after me, or when they left Egypt, when they went just after me in the wilderness." in a land that was not sown. Now, what is the problem in a land that is not being tilled and not being farmed? Well, you don't get anything, right? And me and Donna, and she did it all this year, she hadn't put out a garden, what would we have got from it? Nothing. What would we expected from it? Nothing. Yet and, yet, and yet and still for 40 years, God being a spouse to them, provided again and again. He rained, he rained bread out of heaven. He gave them quail. 
time and time again out of nothing. He provided everything. And you know what? <laughs> for a while they loved him for it. But then what was their state? My soul hateth this light bread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Isn't it, isn't it strange when we when we get sick of the provision of, of the Lord? Mm -hmm. I think about I loved old brother McCoy. Yeah, but <laughs> man, when he got up there, you could you could pick one of the five points and you're gonna get it. <laughs> but you know what? That was bread, wasn't it? Sure. It was bread. You ever get burnt out on bread? I love it, so I, I don't. But I know a lot of people that do. Uh, Donna's went a little crazy with our bread recently. It's real good, but it's different. You know what I'm saying? And uh, they got sick of it. You know when you're going to get sick of the Lord's blessings? When you stop recognizing them. Yeah. When you stop recognizing, you'll get sick of it. Uh, you, you'll, you'll no longer enjoy it. You'll no longer have a happiness in Christ. So he said, you did better when you were young than now when you're old. Israel was holiness. Verse 3, Israel was holiness. What a compliment. Well, what a, what a wonderful thing to say about a people group. Your holiness. Listen, holiness is not a denomination that wears bonds and, and skirts all the time and flops on the floor. Holiness is a condition of God's people. Holiness. He said you were, and underlined were, that's who you were. That's who you were used to be known by. Shouldn't that be the desire of God's people this morning that we're known by holiness? We don't look like the rest of the world. We don't act like the rest of the world. That we are known by our holiness. Israel was holiness unto the Lord. The first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. In the end of verse 3, we begin to get up, uh, get protective blessings of the Lord. He said, in addition to doing as well as you were, I took care of you. You ever feel unsafe? You ever, you ever feel being threatened? Y'all remember the, the church, y'all that were here then. Y'all remember that boy who came in here one night and we ended up buying him a tent to stay in and he wanted to stay in the building. Y'all remember all that? Well, sometime after that, and I worked at Dover, in Dover then, I guess I worked at Home Health, I'm not sure. And he met me here one day. And he goes, do y'all have any money in the building? And he was standing between me and that door. And he was a big old boy. You know what? I felt threatened. And uh, I told him no, because there wasn't no money in here. But you see, what who placed who placed me in that situation? I did, right? He asked me to meet him at the building, and I came here. You know, sometimes we very dumbly place ourselves in spiritual jeopardy. If you get out here in this world, you're placing yourself there. Don't blame God, right? If you go to a false teaching, you go to a false church. Do you go somewhere where they're they're easy on you? Don't blame God. You uh, you you put yourself in that jeopardy, and, and so we find that the protecting hand of God, He reminds them when they were a young nation, God was with you. Now hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord. What iniquity have your fathers found in me? Now, here in the South, almost nobody would say, well, God's done me wrong. But I know a lot of people would thought, thought that way. And, and I, I tell you how erroneous or an era-filled doctrine grows out of that mind of thought that God can do you wrong. God wouldn't t send anybody to hell. God is love. <laughs> you know what? That's erroneous. That, that's wrong. And he, where, where have I wronged thee? 
He has a plan. You know what? If you go to hell, it's on your own responsibility. Because, right. see, sin must be dealt with. Sin must be dealt with here, and if you will not deal with it here, he'll deal with it up there. Because sin, the violation of the law, is going to be dealt with. And dear friend, you ought to much, much prefer for it to be dwelt here on this side of eternity than on the next. Right, amen. It has to be dealt with. And so he said, where have I wronged you? I've provided for you. I, I, I have, I've been your consolation. I've been your resource. What iniquity have your fathers found in me? That they are gone far from me, that they have walked after vanity. Now, the first problem when an individual or a church or a nation is leaving the Lord is thinking that they're pretty good. Vanity. Thinking that they are cut above. You ever think about uh the United States and, and that being applicable to us. I often have. When did our nation really start spiraling out of control? More to, at the end of World War II, right? We literally stomped the, the two greatest nations in the world into the ground, literally. And it buoyed us up in pride, right? And, and, and we... And we find that time and time again in historical nations when they think that they just have finally arrived, they go out in vanity. They no longer say, God did this for us. We did it ourselves. God didn't do this for us. It was because of our strength. And time and time again, you find that through the scriptures. And so he says, because of your vanity, thinking you are so great and not God is so great, that was when you left me. Verse 6, neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt? Now here's something that sovereign gracers are often, are often uh, feel embarrassed maybe or, or don't want to ask. Where is the Lord? You ever felt alone? You ever felt distanced from the Lord because of your sin? I have. And you know what? I have to say, where is the Lord? Now, uh, a lot of people will also contradict this. And, and we know this. God knows everything, right? He's omnipotent. God is everywhere, all the time, at the same time, right? right? So how can he not be with us? Well, I'm with my children all the time, right? Just about, I'm at work. But sometimes I'm with them in different ways, right? <laughs> Bella's still a young child. Sometimes she comes in my chair and sits in my lap. She's with me. And sometimes I have to say, Bell Marie, go to your room and stay there until I tell you to get out. Now, she's still with me, right? But we don't have that relationship like it needs to be. You see what I'm saying? And every one of us in Israel as a nation had done this. They were living at a distance from the Almighty. Now, what that should do to the redeemed is scare us to death. But I don't see that much in the modern age. What it should do to a church is to scare us to death. But I see more people denying it than not. What that should do to us as a nation is scare us to death. But it doesn't. And that was exactly Israel's situation. He, uh, they were no longer fearful of the Almighty. They no longer put the Almighty in, in the place that he justly deserves. He said they no longer feared him. Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt and led us through the wilderness, through the land of the deserts and of the pits, through a land of drought and of, a and of the shadow of death, through a land 
which no man passed through and where no man has dwelt. Have you ever thought about all the things the Lord brought you through? Some things your fault, sometimes maybe not. Have you considered my servant Job? Had Job, Job done anything erroneous? <clears throat> what about John the Baptist? Probably the most faithful servant of the Lord. And he lost his head. Right? Mm -hmm. You know what? God will bring you through a lot more than you think. Right. And here, uh, uh, Brother Junior's told me this many, many times right before that, uh, that uh, device blew up in his hands, he felt an imminent turn. And when it turned to, to the full place, it engaged and it exploded. And that was just a millisecond. Can you imagine? Did you feel like God was with you when you, when you felt it turn? I'm sure for a moment you felt forsaken. You see what I'm saying? But here we are, 35 years later, all is going well. Amen. You see what I'm saying? God is good. And you know what? That's something he can tell everybody around him. If they say, you know, uh, what happened to your hand? Uh, what an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we see there's reasons behind it. And all these things, water literally coming out of a rock to give to, to quench the third the thirst of four and a half million people, plus all their cows and stuff that they took from Egypt. God does that out of nothing. Now, we say, oh, well, that's different. No, no. He does something with you out of nothing every day, I can assure you. Assure you. you know what you are? A rock. <laughs> what, what did the Bible say? <laughs> if these be silent, the rocks and the hills will cry out. Right. So if he can get his praise from them, it ought to be, it ought to be a pleasure, and you ought to feel very, very, have a wonderful opportunity because he's using you instead of a rock. Yeah. And, and so we see, he reminds them, Jeremiah the prophet reminds them all these things he's done for you when you were coming through Egypt. Remember that. Verse 7, And I brought you into a plentiful country, they're finally in Israel, to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, ye defiled the land. Now, one thing I want you to remember about Israel, and when we get and we get home to be with the Lord, it'll be the very same with us. The land of Israel was already, was, it was not a wilderness. It was already a very settled land. It had vineyards or, or places for the grapes to grow before they got there. They took other people's stuff. Yeah. Remember, before even the uh, 40, before the 40 years uh, out of the desert, remember they came back with a thing of grapes that they had to carry on two men on a stick? Right. Well, he's already growing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what? 40 years later, they were still growing. And there were sheep, and there were, and there were wheat, everything that they needed. They literally walked in and just took possession of it. What a blessed God. What, what a, and you know what? We have the same thing going on every day. You know, it's easy to get prideful, men, Oh, we have this because I worked hard. No, more certainly didn't. You know why well, you have it? Because of the goodness of God. Yeah. And so we see that he reminds them, and Israel had gotten in a bad shape. Israel had allowed the world in. And he says, can't you remember this? All the wonderful. And <laughs> apparently they didn't. But when you entered... You defiled my land. What did he say about you? Your soul, right? right? Now, I understand you 
can't defile it in the sense that you're going to be lost again. But how many people know you're a Christian without saying one word to you? What color shirt I've got on? Blue, right? How can you tell that by looking at it? What can they tell you about you simply by looking? I think that's critical. And, and they had they had lost that along the way. They they had forgotten what the Lord was about. They had forgotten. And they went in and they messed up the land. And he says, and made my heritage an abomination. And, and, and what was their heritage? It was not the land. The land, you know, all through the, and I know one day that will be back. But you know what the land really is? It's a type. Their real heritage, what's my heritage? Is it a, a double line on top of a steep Tennessee hill? <laughs> if that's all, all, all I have, it's a pretty poor heritage, right? No, my heritage is right here. That's my heritage. And it's a big time, right? You want to hurt your own children? Everybody say, oh, absolutely not. I wouldn't do nothing to harm them. Well, sometimes we do. Let them watch what they want to on TV. Let them find whatever they want on this. You know what you're doing? You're destroying their heritage. You're destroying your people. Be very cautious about this. And listen, nowadays, when they're born, they already know how to use one. Uh, and so we need to be we need to be very cautious, do we not? Limit, be, limit to what they're doing. And so we see then that was the same way they had trashed all of Israel, not thinking about the next generation, not thinking about the next set of people that would take their place. Verse eight, the priest said. Not, where is the Lord? And the priest said not, where is the Lord? You know what? Uh, it is, well, what that would mean in modern day is your good pastor saying simply, the Lord is not meeting with us. Where is the Lord? Now, why won't most pastors say that? Because most congregations blame them, <laughs> right? Where is the Lord? 2023, where is the Lord? Well, he's with his people when they're serving him. Where is the Lord? I had to take some stuff to another church this morning, flower arrangement. Is that where the Lord was? I don't think so. Where is the Lord? Where is the Lord? And so their preachers wasn't identifying the problem and wasn't saying, hey, church, the Lord's not meeting with us. So th there's something erroneous here. There's a problem here because the Lord is not meeting. Because when they were perfect alignment, two times for sure, they were in perfect alignment with God. When Moses finished the wilderness temple, remember the presence of the Almighty, came down and filled the wilderness tabernacle. And then when they got the building built, and they had all that sacrificial stuff ready, and Solomon made his declaration, the Bible says that the Lord came down and filled the temple. What if nothing had happened? Remember when David lost the ark? Running around naked? You know what? Uh, David didn't say, the Lord is with us. He addressed the problem. You know what a good pastor will do for you? He will address the problem. Right? And so they lived in a day where no one was addressing the problem. No one, you know, uh, as the old saying goes, uh, 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 the, the purple elephant was in the room and nobody was pointing him out. And often, you know, 
if you travel much and go to other churches, you'll see that. And it's almost taboo to say, hey, there's a problem here. We need to be able to address that. So the nation of Israel, the, particularly the city of Jerusalem, was having this problem. And the priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not, having preachers that weren't saved men. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets, and the prophets prophesied by Baal. Now, what is the message of Baal? Everything is going to get better. That's the prophecy of Baal. Everything is going to get gooder and gooder. Jack, uh, Jerry, help me with the name. The one that's like, uh, you're going to get rich if you serve the Lord. Thank you. You know what he is? He's a prophet of Baal. He's a prophet of Baal. He, he's preaching something that's not true, but it sounds really, really good. All you have to do is to be baptized. That's a prophet of Baal. All you have to do is repeat this. That's a prophet of Baal. You know, I've often wondered what, what these men were preaching. And it was probably saying, just keep the law and everything. I, I know he's not meeting with us right now, but if you'll keep the law, it, it doesn't matter if he's meeting with us or not. And you know what? I believe the flesh really feels that way. Well, he's not meeting with us, but <laughs> we're sovereign gracers. Right? I'm going to be upset if he's not meeting with us. I'm going to be troubled. I'm, I'm going to be heart sick if the Lord is not meeting with us. And that is exactly where each and every believer, I think, will be. And huh, the nation wasn't. So Jeremiah reminds, us, reminds them of all these things. And then he says, Wherefore I, or meaning the Lord God, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with their children's children will I plead. Now, this morning, if you're lost, is the Lord pleading with you? If you're saved and you have something in your life that you know very good and well ain't where it needs to be, is the Lord pleading with you? See, this is the, what, the thing with the Lord's plea. It will always move you toward holiness. You know what the Lord never says? Don't need you doing great. Do what you want to. No. Never goes that way. He stands and pleads and says, I am the Savior. Trust me. He, he, he stands and says to the redeemed, my way's best. Go with me. You notice whenever he called the apostles, what did he, uh, what did he always say? Come and follow me. Do you do that? Do, do you follow the Lord? Do you, do you pay attention to his direction? Is he leading you? See, if the Lord ever stopped leading me, I'd be alarmed. And I believe any true believer is the same way. If they're not hearing from God, it upsets them. And if you're okay with that, make your calling and election sure this morning.